Good morning. That's my volume check for today. Is it loud enough? I hope so. It should probably go up a little bit. So, I wanted to highlight a few things on the bulletin, if nobody, you know, saw this or, or, or took it or grabbed it. The, at the top, uh, I wanted to highlight, because I don't know if we plug this enough, but we do sell uh, Quick Trip uh, script cards. So, if you'd like to buy some of those from the church, um, for buying those, it actually comes back to the church, and uh, there's proceeds that go to our benevolence fund. So you can purchase those here if you're a frequent quick tripper like I am. Hot sandwiches are the bane of my existence, and I can't stay away from them. Then there's the well-oiled class. Uh, if you guys don't know John Swanson, that guy is a gem, and he works for uh, CLA Accounting. Super smart. And if you want any in-depth insight into budgeting, or managing your finances, planning for the future, or navigating all of this high inflation, high price grocery shopping that we have these days, um, he is the guy to talk to. Uh, the first class starts on September 29th. There's a couple people who have already signed up for it, uh, but there's room for more. So definitely consider signing up for that class if you would like to learn more about how to manage your money well, right? So yeah, just wanted to plug those two things before we started today. And now on to the message. Have you guys ever received a gift that you didn't feel like you deserved or that you did not expect to come your way? Like a, a real true surprise. Have you guys ever watched those videos of like parents that surprise their kids with like a trip to Disneyland? And they, they catch them in the car, and they got their suitcases all packed up. They don't know where they're going, and then they spring it on them, like, we're going to Disneyland, and they freak out. Or the videos of Christmas, and there's a giant car out in the driveway with the huge oversized bow on top, and it's like the dad's dream car that he's always wanted since he was a kid. Or there's the videos of like the puppy inside of the box, and it springs open, and everybody's excited. On my 30th birthday, uh, my wife actually surprised me with a huge Lego set that she got all of my friends to pitch in and get this thing for me. It's from The Lord of the Rings, and it's a giant Rivendell scene with trees and elves, and it's super nerdy. And it's got like 6,200 pieces. It was the coolest thing ever. Did not expect that at all. She coordinated it with everybody, and, and they all pitched in, because those things are expensive. And I got to tell you, when I opened it and I looked at it, A, I was surprised, but B, I was like, I don't deserve this like this is this is not cheap like I know how much these are because I've looked it up and I've added it to my wish list on Amazon and I know exactly how much they are and I'm like I, it was like that weird feeling of like I, I thank you but like where'd you get all the money for this you know like and she's like we all pitched in and got it. I was like okay that makes sense right but you know if you've ever experienced something like that where you received a gift that was unexpected um, or was like a really big expensive thing, you can think about like, how did that make you feel? Or if you've ever seen those videos and you see how people react to something like that. It's pretty special. And there is a, there is a mix of emotions there that happens, right? Like, it's like, do I deserve this? Oh my gosh, I'm really excited. Shock, all of it. It's kind of interesting. There's a book in the Bible called 1 John, and it actually talks about uh, a gift. And it talks about the gift of love. And that's what I want to talk about today. 1 John. So, a little bit of context for 1 John. Talking about giving and receiving gifts. 
We're going to kind of take some time to go through a couple verses in chapter 4 and go through them together. And this portion for 1 John, um, this is a letter that the Apostle John wrote. Uh, a little bit about the Apostle John. Since he was Apostle, that means that he walked with Jesus. So he knew him personally. He was a disciple. And John is cool because he, he wrote more than just one book. So John wrote uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, which are all his letters that he wrote that got compiled. Then he also wrote the Gospel of John, and he also wrote Revelations, too. So John's a pretty cool guy. And these letters that he wrote were probably written to the churches that were closely associated with where he was traveling around and where he did most of his travel after Jesus died, resurrected, went to heaven. When he was on his mission field, he was in like modern day Turkey. So he was going and helping churches that were already started. He was helping plant new churches and he was writing letters to existing believers. And that's what this letter was in 1 John. He was writing a letter to people who had already decided that they were going to start following this Jesus movement that was going on at the time. Which I think is important to kind of set the stage as we go through this together. So in chapter 4 of his letter, his first letter, he talks about the gift of love. And right before the verse that we're going to start with in verse, verse 4, he is talking to the church, these Christians, and the way it's written, it's like he intends for it to get circulated around to other people. They would get the letter and then they would repeat the message to other people. So he's expecting this to hopefully spread to as many people as he could get this in front of, right? He's talking about how there are people who are claiming to speak the word of God or claiming to follow Jesus, but their words are not, messi- or their, their words are not lining up with the message. He's warning them about false prophets, about people who claim to be following the movement, but they are in it for their own gain. They're people who are just trying to get famous off of the message, people who are just trying to make a quick buck off of people, people who are trying to deceive other people and maybe just trying to gain their own power, right? They're doing it for themselves. And so he gives a warning to them. Hey, watch out for this. It's happening. I've heard about it. It's going on. And he reminds them that they have the spirit that lives within them and that the spirit that lives within them is different than the spirit that's in the world. And you're going to know the difference because how people are acting and what they're doing isn't going to line up with what Jesus' message was, which is love. So he starts off in verse 4. He says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people, talking about those false prophets, the people who are coming against them. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to the world, so they speak from the world's point of view. And the, world's, and the world listens to them when they speak. But we belong to God, and those who God listens, or, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. John is reminding his audience that the message that was being spoken by Jesus and the message that was then being carried on by the disciples, the apostles, and all the churches that were deciding to follow Jesus was going to be different than what they were hearing out in the world. It was going to be the opposite. 
the world was going to offer a lot of different things every single day, just like it does today. Money, fame, likes, follows, fast food, fast weight loss, fast love, fast cars, political agendas, protection, safety, comfort, all good things, fun times, quick fixes, they're going to hear it all. Good thing we don't hear about that today, right? That was just during these ancient Bible times. Right. I don't think so. I think we hear a lot of that today. And he's reminding them that we belong to a very different spirit, a very different world. We belong to a very different God. We belong to God, to the God. And those who belong to him have his spirit living inside of us. And his spirit speaks a very different message. And the core of that message is love. He makes a point to talk about the power of the spirit and how it has the power to be victorious and that it's living inside of us. And he wants to get across this message because he's about to ask his listeners that are reading this letter to go do something. He's going to call them to some action. And he's reminding them that if you're going to go do something, you're going to need the power to go do it. And that power is the Spirit of God. And it's inside of you. He's reminding them, before I set you off here to go do something, you can do it. Because Jesus lives inside of you. Spirit is there. His power to do it is there, and he's equipping you. It enables us to carry out his commands. And that's where we pick up in verse 7. He says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God, and anyone who loves his child, or anybody who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anybody who does not love does not know God. For God is love. It's a very simple message, yet it is also very deep reaching, right? There's layers to that. We're supposed to love one another because God gives us love. That love is for us, And it is for other people. And anybody who loves others like God loves us has clearly understood what it's like to be loved by God. And if you or somebody that you know has a really hard time loving other people or loving yourself, maybe they need a little bit of that love from God. And maybe there is room to have a deeper understanding of what that love looks like. The word that they use, that he chooses to use in this letter, is very important. The word for love that he wrote in his letter is on purpose. John wrote this letter in Greek. And the Greek word that he uses for love in his statement, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God, is the word agape love. And that's important. The Greek word agape has really, really deep meaning. And it has its own definition. In English, we just say love. And love is love. I love pizza. Right? I love lasagna. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family. Right? It's, all, it's all the same love. It's just the one word, right? What's cool about the Greek is it had different words to mean different things for love. And this love was unique. He uses two words here, agapeo and agape. Agapeo is a verb, and agape 
is the word love. He says, let us continue to love one another. This was agapeo, the verb, a call to action, a purposeful call to love other people. It was the verb version of agape. And agape love is very specific in that the definition means fatherly, reciprocal love. It was the highest form of love that, it, that could be written. People who read it knew that this type of love was the love synonymous with God's love. It all meant the same thing. It meant love that was coming to us and then love that was also going back to him. It was like all wrapped into one, and it was very fatherly. It was very father to child. It was a gift. It was free. It had no strings attached. It was deep, and it meant connection and intimacy in a very family sense, not, not love like sexual love. It was, it, was, it was a deep meaning to love. And that's important because this is what he's calling people to do. This is what he's asking people to latch on to. And that's important because there's weight to that. The agape love word is used throughout the New Testament, and it becomes synonymous in the New Testament with the actual act of Jesus dying on the cross for you and I. That was a full, true expression of agape love. And they used that over and over to describe the type of love that was given to us. But then, clearly, John used it as a way to remind people of how they should be loving all of the people around them. That's pretty powerful. That is some strong stuff. What's really cool about this too is agape love is used in another way in the Bible and specifically in the New Testament with the early church. They used to use that word to describe the feasts of fellowship that they had with each other. They would call them agape feasts. Agape fellowships. And just so you guys know, what we did at the park last week when we all got together and we were down at the band shell and we were eating food and fellowshipping with each other and worshiping God and doing that, that is an agape feast. That is an example of exactly what he was talking about. Anytime that we have the opportunity to worship God, worship who he is, share a meal together, fellowship with each other, build relationship, that is a great way to show agape love to other people and to experience it. So it's definitely on purpose that this was used here. And can I just say, after describing all of that, the journey of understanding God's agape love for us is just that. It is very much a journey of going through that. And it is a journey that does not end while we are alive. It's something that just keeps going all the way to the end. It develops and it grows. We have the potential to grow deeper in our understanding of God's love for us every single day for the rest of our lives. And in the end, we will still only scratch the surface of who God really is, how much he really deeply loves us, and how much we're called to deeply love other people. Like, there is so much room for us to grow in our understanding of who he is and how much he loves us. And the more we pursue that and dive into that, the more we get to offer that love to other people. And that's what he's asking here in 1 John. That's what he's getting to. And that's what takes us into verse 9 through 12. It talks about how much God loves us. 
He's not just going to sit there and tell people what to do and not give them any context of what that love looks like. He immediately jumps into how much he loves us. Verse 9 through 12 says, God showed how much he loves us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. And as we've just mentioned, the word he put there was this is real agape. This isn't the fake stuff. He just got done talking about what they were going to be offered by the fake people. And he said, no, no, no. If you want to know what real is, this is the real. The real love, the real good love, is the agape love. It's the love of the Father sending his Son into the world to die so that we could have eternal life. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away all sin. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Kind of loved that sound like. Hmm? Different. That's the kind. It's a different kind. It's an agape love. It's the opposite of selfish. It's selfless. And he loves us so, so, so much that he sent his son to die, to be put to death, that he didn't deserve for you and for me, so that we could have a repaired relationship with God. So that we could have the hope and the gift of eternal life in heaven. It was sacrificial, undeserving, unexpected, and it was a true gift. We did not earn this love, and there isn't anything that we could do to lose this love. No mistake too big to disqualify us. Nothing that we could do to earn it or to buy it. It was ready for us to receive freely. And the more we learn how much we are loved, the easier it is for us to love others that are around us. The way that we're called to love in this passage is in its full expression, he says. In its full understanding. How it was truly meant to be. In its full fulfillment, the way it was always intended. Jesus was the living embodiment of that love when he was here on this earth. That's why it's so important to read the Gospels and look at how Jesus lived and what he did. Because if you want to know what love is, just watch how that guy did stuff. He was the living embodiment of agape love. How he treated people and how he navigated situations and relationships is the way. It's the way. It's how we do it. That's why here at Connection Church we have a core value that's to learn from Jesus to live like him. It's one of my favorite ones that we have. Because if we want to live like him, we have to know how he lived. And that's why we talk about it. His death on the cross was the ultimate expression of love. He got to live it out the whole time he was alive. And then in that final moment, it was fully fulfilled. When we love others the way that Jesus loves us and the way he loved people, it is the closest thing that we get here on this earth to a tangible, seeing, believing, and understanding relationship with who Jesus and who God really is. What he really intended for us. And guess what? We get to go do that. We have the ability and the Spirit's empowerment 
to go do that today. It's the ultimate expression of who Jesus is. And that love is the love that we have the power to go give other people. Like, it's not just the fake love. It's the love that we actually get to offer to others. <laughs> we receive this love from the Father, and now we get to reciprocate it to others. So in verse 13 through 16, it talks about living life with the love that God has inside of us. It says this, God gave us the Spirit. He's given us the Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Because remember, John was there. He eyewitnessed this. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in His love. God is love. God is agape. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence, knowing that we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. Because he loved us first. Hmm. Because he loved us, we love others. Before we loved others, he was always love. And he never stops. It always was and it always will be. This world is full of fear. Fear is the campaign slogan of the devil. Fear is an amazing motivator. Dare I say that our country loves to worship, consume, and full pedal to the metal, drive forward on the backbone of fear. We just love it here. It's everywhere. Everywhere we look, it's all about fear. And um, last time I checked, that means that that would be the message of the world. And Jesus, his message is the opposite of the message of the world. His message is a message of love. And according to this, this love drives out that fear. This love is what conquers that fear. It is the 180 degree difference from fear. And in a world where fear is offered to you on your phone and through advertisers, through the news, through people who want to sell it to you, and to politicians who want to cram it down your throat. Fear has no place in love. John saw the love of Jesus firsthand. He was an eyewitness to who he was. And now he's talking to an audience that didn't get a chance to live with Jesus day to day. He's, he's trying to describe to them who he was when he got to live with him what that love really looked like. And God is speaking this message of love through John to the early church and now to us. And that same love that the disciples experienced when they walked with Jesus is the same that we get to experience today in our lives. And it's a gift. I had talked about the Lego set that I had got, right? Well... Let me just say that that pales into comparison to the greatest gift that I've received in the last many years, and that's been my time in counseling, working on my story, 
and the love that I've received through people who have clothed themselves in Jesus and being him for me in person. That has been the greatest gift that I've received in a long, long time. And it's truly special. I had to receive it from people who were acting through agape love. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. I knew I needed it. But it was given to me as a gift from somebody who knew how to love well. That circle is something you all, we all get to recreate everywhere we go if we take it to heart, if we put it to action, and if we step out and live it out. And that's why he's sending this letter. He's sending this letter to the church to remind them this is what we're called to do. This is what we have an opportunity to do. How do we expect to love others well if we don't love ourselves? Right? It's where it starts. We need to learn how to love ourselves. I am able to love my wife and my kids and my coworkers and my friends and the random people that I come into contact with as the Spirit enables me. But man, does that get easier when I learn how to love myself better. From growing and evolving and understanding of how much I am loved, the more I am able to know him and how much he loves me. And I'm not perfect. None of us are. And we never will be. So in case you were hoping to hit perfection one day, um, sorry. It's not possible. But we are called to love others and to live more like Jesus. That we can do. But it takes some work. And it takes some doing. And it's hard work. It's not easy. Let me just say that if you've ever felt the way that I've felt, unworthy or being unkind to yourself, please seek some help. Talk to somebody. I know here at Connection Church, we have a staff that would love to talk to you. We have licensed counselors that would love to talk to you. And that is something that Jesus would want for us. And it's something that we choose to offer to each other. But can I just say that there's that. There's also the relationships that we get to just have with each other through friendship and through fellowship and through a church body that brings the exact same healing through love if we allow it. And it's learning how to love well and learning how to receive love well. It says in verse 18, that love expels all fear. And I will just say that agape love does more than just expel fear. It actually heals us. It heals us from shame that we feel and experience. It heals us from, from trauma that we've experienced. Dan Allender, who's a Christian author and professor, he's somebody that Autumn introduced me to, in his work, in his books, in his everything that he puts out. <laughs> he focuses on trauma healing and shame healing, and he says this about it. The war against shame is not fought and won by military might or will. It is won through love. Right? You can put a lot of effort towards it but the thing that actually heals is love. And it's love from the Father, and it's love from people who are doing the work of the Father. It's people who are learning to love other people the way that we're called to be loved and to love others the way we're called to love others. 
He ends with this at the end of chapter 4. He says in verse 20, If somebody says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people that we can see, how can we love God who we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. That's harsh. That's a gut punch. But so true. If we are incapable of loving those around us, uh, we might need to examine our hearts and take inventory. Ask ourselves, maybe it's because I don't know how much I am loved. Maybe it's because I don't truly understand how much God really loves me. Because if I did, I would love others the way that I'm loved. But let me just say this. It's okay to admit that loving other people and loving ourselves is really hard. I'm not just saying, oh, yep, that's me, and then that's it. Or, sure, that sounds great. Super easy. Nope. Hard stuff. Hard, hard stuff. It can be very, very, very difficult. Not only is it hard sometimes to love people who are hard to love, but it's also hard to know how much we are loved in this true agape love way, the way Jesus intended for us, as John described. We walk into this Christian walk of trying to love other people and love ourselves from a place of our own ideas and our own experiences and our own traumas that have skewed and distorted our ideas of what love really is. We all have that. There's not anybody who's been spared that. It's the nature of living. It's it's our lives. So don't feel bad if this is hard for you or if it's hard to fully grasp that unconditional love that he talks about. Because we all walk into this with our own filter of where we've come from. The key is, is to acknowledge that and then work on that. Talk to somebody about it. Maybe receive some love that we all deserve. The love that can actually heal those places in our hearts and in our lives. Because that's what God wants for us. It's what he would hope we would all receive is healing and truth and the opposite of fear. It's the gift that he wants to give us. But man, we have a hard time going up and picking it up, don't we? It's hard. It's really hard. But it's waiting for you. And it might take a little work. But I encourage all of us to learn to love well, to learn to love ourselves well, to learn to understand how much God truly loves you, that he died for you so that you could be loved, feel love, and be healed so that you can love other people. He wrote this letter with a purpose. He wrote it to remind people, don't give up hope. Don't give up. You're going to be persecuted. It's going to be hard. So I'm going to send this letter to you to remind you how much God loves you and what you're supposed to be doing out there. In case you lost the mission, the mission was love other people. That's what we're going to do here at Connection Church is we're going to love other people. And as long as the board and the, the staff and everybody who's 
helping make decisions on where this thing's going, we're going to keep loving people. And that'll always be core to who we are, and it'll never change. This love comes from Jesus, and Jesus loves you, and we have the privilege to love others. So let's love others, and let's receive agape love from the Father and from other people, because it comes from both. Sound good? Let's do it. Um, I'm going to hang out up here after I'm done. And Jason, if you want to hang up too, um, and Autumn as well, if anybody feels like they need to receive a little bit of encouragement or love today, come on up, and we can pray for you. But also, if you've never experienced Jesus' love, and you don't know what I'm talking about, um, and you want to invite him into your heart, uh, we would love to pray for you as well and ask for that for you because it's as simple as that. It's as simple as just asking him to come into your heart and, and receive that love. And if you've never made that decision, today could be the day for you, and it's free. So I'm going to pray, and then we will be up here. You guys have a great rest of your Sunday. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for who you are. We thank you for the love that you've given us. We thank you for people like John who took the time to write down your messages, write down the words that you had for the people, for us to hear, and that you have such an unending, <laughs> unexpected, unselfish, agape love for us that is there waiting for us. I pray that you would empower, empower us through the Spirit to love other people the way we're called to, to love, and that we would all receive that power to do that every day, and that we would be given the opportunity to love people well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.